Quite a lot has been written about the concentration camps set up by Nazi Germany and the so-called rules there. But even today it is difficult to perceive information about these death factories. Probably a normal person will never be able to get used to such inhumane sadism. It seems that the leadership of the Reich and its personnel services specially selected notorious sadists to work in these camps, giving them opportunity to realize their most sadistic fantasies. For example, in Dachau, one of the oldest camps of the Third Reich, which existed in Germany from 1933 to 1945, there was a doctor, Sigmund Rascher. In his sadistic inclinations and fantasies, he was in no way inferior to the notorious Dr. Menele from Auschwitz. Rascher was very fond of conducting experiments on living people. He could spend hours watching a man submerged up to his neck in icy water. Then he carried out procedures to, as it was called, rescue the frozen prisoner. As a rule, the procedures ended in failure and the subject died. But this didn't bother Rasher much. The next victim was always ready to replace the deceased. Rasher also infected people with various illnesses – malaria, tuberculosis, dysentery, typhoid, etc. He specifically gave time for the disease to develop its final stage. Only then he began the so-called treatment by giving or injecting the poor with all sorts of drugs that had not passed any serious tests. That is, he tested poorly studied or newly created drugs. The mortality rate was as high as 80%, but the survivors had nothing to hope for because they remained living material. In addition to the sadist rasher at Dachau, there was his colleague Dr. Hans Appiner, also a so-called researcher. Once on his command, 90 gypsies were selected who were deprived of food and water and given only sea water to drink. Within a few days, People were so dehydrated that they licked the washed floor with their tongues and remaining moisture. This greatly amused Epiner. According to the prisoners' recollections, those prisoners who were suspected of having spoken ill of Hitler, the camp had its own informers among the prisoners, were dipped upside down into a barrel of sewage and feces. Such torture could last for several hours until the prisoner completely choked. In addition to planned tests, experiments, and hard work, the prisoners of the concentration camps were also dominated by the autocracy of the staff, the camp guards and their henchmen. Policemen recruited from traitor prisoners who agreed to cooperate with the fascists and themselves became executioners for the prisoners. Camp executioners loved to arrange sadistic entertainment, the objects of which were defenseless prisoners, children. For example, the camp guards liked siren torture. At the sound of the siren, the children had to run to the barracks where their mothers were, but as soon as they reached the mother's barracks, the next siren sounded, according to which they had to urgently return to their barracks. Those children who arrived later than others were beaten with a baton or kicked. Another entertainment for the camp fanatics was the murder of children in front of their mothers. Such inhumane methods were used in order to punish a mother for any offense or disobedience. They took the child by the legs and, spinning him around, hit his head against the table or the wall. Mothers often could not stand such torture and died themselves. Drunken guards often held races for prisoners. The prisoners were harnessed to carts. This could be adult men, women, or children. Drunken fascists competed to see whose team would arrive first. The gas chamber awaited the last prisoner to arrive. At the same time, the executioners urging their drivers with whips and forced them to sing songs. Also, poor little prisoners of Nazi camps were suppliers of blood and skin for wounded and burned German soldiers and officers. After several blood draws, the already weakened prisoners were doomed. The SS men and their henchmen from the camp guard also liked to bully women. A particularly cruel fate awaited virgin women, who were subjected to repeated rape. The violence could last for several hours as guards took turns. The guards could force prisoners to crawl on the ground where stones, manure, and broken glass was gathered. One can only imagine the sight of these smeared, cut, exhausted people. It was especially difficult for Jews and prisoners of war in the concentration camps. Memo from the head of Smirsch, Viktor Abakumov to the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars Andrei Vishnitsky. In mid-January 1943, they captured a transit camp for prisoners of war the so-called Dulag 205. Thousands of corpses of prisoners of war and commanders who died from exhaustion and cold were discovered in and around the camp. Several hundred tortured ex-servicemen exhausted from hunger were also released. 
An investigation was carried out during which it was revealed that German officers and soldiers following the instructions of the German military command, treated prisoners of war with humiliation, brutally extermination them through mass beating and executions, creating unbearable living conditions in the camp and starving them to death. The key phrase in this document is German officers and soldiers carrying out the instructions of the German military command. This is the whole point of what happened. For such treatment of prisoners in transit camps or concentration camps, the Nazis not only received indulgences from the authorities, but it turns out carried out the instructions. Everybody has probably already heard about gold crowns. Usually this was done by the so-called capos, policemen from among the prisoners who agreed to help the owners in exchange for a hearty meal. They broke out the gold crowns from the prisoners and not only from the dead, but also from the living. Then they exchanged them for vodka, with the SS guards. It is clear that the male half of the concentration camp employees were in a special position. They were the masters in the concentration camp. Their wishes were in fact a law for everyone and primarily for prisoners. The SS often organized so-called death races. They stood in two ranks facing each other, forming a kind of corridor along which the prisoners had to run, and the cheerful SS men at this time tripped or pushed them. Anyone who fell was killed right there on the spot. The crematory and gas chambers of the concentration camp worked almost non-stop. The initiator of the use of the poisonous gas Zyklon B hydrogen cyanide was a certain Karl Fritsch, who calculated that 10 kilograms of this gas was enough to destroy 4,000 people. In 1942, 7.5 tons of gas were supplied to Auschwitz, and in 1943, already 12.2 tons. In some gas chambers, there were special windows through which guards watched the torture of people. The doctor there, Joseph Manley, was very fond of experiments and also on people. He especially liked to castrate boys and men without anesthesia. The prisoner recalled that while in the concentration camp, he had the opportunity to see boys from 9 to 4 years old who underwent and survived this terrible operation. Subsequently, they were used in various jobs. I could not look into the eyes of these poor children without pain. Their gaze was lifeless, they were apathetic and slow. And on women, Manley tests strength with electric shock, cold and pressure. He also liked experiments on the female uterus. What only he didn't experiment it with, poisons, gases and all kinds of infections were injected into this female organ. In the camps, houses of tolerance were set up, especially for capos and low ranks of camp servants for motivation purposes. Beautiful women were taken to a separate barracks and were sent to work less often. The assignments were not too difficult. The food was a little better, but their fate was also unenviable. They had to serve several guards per night, and if an ordinary warden or capo didn't like something, the woman could be beaten or maimed. Often, women agreed to this unenviable role for the sake of the children, who were also located in the camp. In case of escape of one of the prisoners, the Germans applied the principle of collective responsibility. For one fugitive, 10 prisoners could be killed. Punishment was also applied by a roll call, which could last 10-15 hours. Once in Auschwitz, such a roll call lasted almost a day, 20 hours. As a result, some exhausted prisoners could not reach their barracks on their own. Decimation was also used. When among hundreds or several selected prisoners, lots were cast and those who were unlucky, and this could be several dozen or even a hundred people, were sent to the guest chamber. Torture by a goat was also used, a specially equipped machine to which a prisoner was tied and stretched, after which he was beaten with a stick, while the prisoner himself had to count the blows in German. If poor guy got confused or made a mistake, the process started over. Also, the Nazis used gallows for entertainment. A prisoner or a group of prisoners was led to the gallows a noose was placed around their neck, a drum roll and a command sounded. But the cap was only slightly kicked the stool on which the prisoner stood, without knocking him out completely. The SS men were greatly amused by the sight of the prisoners who had already said goodbye to their life. Thus we have two main causes of atrocities in concentration camps and prisoners of war camps. The first is the agreement of the leaders of the Nazi regime of the Hitler's Germany to exterminate people as much as possible by any means. Secondly, these were the manic tendencies of the camp staff themselves. Impunity opened up a wide field for them to implement their unhealthy addictions. When the Americans occupied the Dachau concentration camp and saw what was happening there, they began to shoot the Nazis. 
The camp commandant SS from one Euro Heinrich Skadzenski was also shot. In the first hour, 122 SS men were killed, and 40 more were subjected to reprisals by prisoners. The American court found the actions of the U.S. Army servicemen justified. According to the memoirs of the Auschwitz prisoner who survived this nightmare, Lviv Jew Edmund Seidel, it was a real hell, a kind of vicious circle behind barbed wire, from which there were no way out. But even here, in humane conditions, people did not lose faith in the victory of justice. The prisoners lived, fought, and died. But the Nazis failed to break their spirit. <laughs>